Over the last 30 years, remarkably little has been done to document the history of financial, therapeutic, and operational policy with respect to addiction and behavioral treatment. As part of our mission, C4 has developed a series of films capturing this important oral history. If you have a thought about what you're going to do, or what might be online, or might be in a video game, or on a porn site, or on a social media channel, or you think something's going to be pleasurable, or for that matter, if you think taking that drug or drinking that drink is going to be pleasurable, your dopamine is already elevating at 100% of what it would elevate if you actually did the drug. This is why triggering in addiction is such a big issue because you've already relapsed, you've already used whatever substance or behavior there is before you've actually done it. Dr. David Greenfield is the founder of the Center for Internet and Technology Addiction and is assistant clinical professor of psychiatry at the University of Connecticut School of Medicine, where he teaches courses on sexual medicine and internet addiction in the psychiatry residency program. He's recognized as one of the world's leading voices on process and behavioral addictions and is author of Virtual Addiction, which rang an early warning bell regarding the country's growing internet addiction problem. Dr. Greenfield is widely credited with popularizing the variable ratio reinforcement schedule of process addiction and the dopamine behavioral addiction connection. My name is Dr. David Greenfield. I have been in practice since the mid-1980s. My field of specialty is addiction medicine and in about the mid to late 1990s, I started to develop a subspecialty in internet and technology addiction. So this was a new thing. Computers were just really becoming popular and the internet just sort of started. And this is long before we had Wi-Fi and high-speed internet and smartphones and anything that really made technology what it is today. But yet what we noticed early on was that people were spending a lot of time on the internet even though it was slow and not very efficient. So it was kind of the Wild West, and it got me very curious. And I had a background in three areas that kind of coalesced that made me interested. One was I always had a background in electronics and technology. I put myself through my training uh, fixing TVs and stereos, so I really loved technology and always had a fascination with it. So it was natural for me to be uh, interested in technology and technology addiction. And the other areas, I had a background in addiction medicine, so that was my specialty. It just kind of came together that I felt the same feeling of being compelled when I went online that I felt when I went to a casino or something like that. I noticed a study that had gotten published back in the mid-90s comparing gambling addicts with um, internet addicts or people that were overusing the internet. And that's when I had the idea to do a study, a large scale study, and I contacted ABC News. And we put up a study on their web servers and we got about 17,000 responses. And then we used that data to really formulate some of our more mature ideas on what internet addiction is and where we think it's going. And that became the basis of a book that I wrote in 99 called virtual addiction. And then really what happened that sort of moved this forward is that the Associated Press was at a presentation that I did. And once the wire services picked this up, it has been nonstop media focus. No exaggeration for the last 20 years. And that sort of fed into my needing to do more and learn more. And then I started giving presentations and teaching and developing treatment techniques, and then we opened our own center in uh, the late 90s called the Center for Internet and Technology Addiction, where we treat it. And then we developed an intensive outpatient program, and now we're about to open what will be called the Greenfield Center, which is a 30-bed residential program for the treatment of internet and video game addiction. 
the brain doesn't know what, what that drug of choice is that's elevating that dopamine. It doesn't care. All it knows is that it's either anticipating that hit or it's reacting to that hit. And what's really interesting about the reward centers of the brain is that anticipated dopamine release is double that of regular release. So if you have a, if you have a thought about what you're going to do or what might be online, or might be in a video game, or on a porn site, or on a social media channel, or you think something's gonna be pleasurable. Or for that matter, if you think taking that drug or drinking that drink is gonna be pleasurable, your dopamine is already elevating at 100% of what it would elevate if you actually did the drug. This is why triggering in addiction is such a big issue, because you've already relapsed, you've already used whatever substance or behavior there is before you've actually done it. Your brain knows that. And anticipated dopamine release is sort of your brain's maybe factor. So what I talk about a lot is that the internet is the world's largest slot machine. You don't know what you're gonna get, when you're gonna get it, and what it's gonna be, and how good it's gonna be. So every time you go on your phone and look at it and scroll through it, looking for something, or you go on, on a tablet or a phone, you're looking, you're scrolling, you're looking, you're you're going on things, and every once in a while you see something that might be interesting or you might be, might be relevant or might be pleasurable. It might be somebody saying, hey, I want to do an interview with you. So that gives you a little blip of dopamine, so then you do it again. But it's the maybe, it's the variable ratio reinforcement. It's this idea, like a slot machine, that you might get something, but you don't know what and you don't know when. And everybody is being conditioned by their devices, especially their phones, to check it over and over and over again. And we're using it so much now that we're on average spending between three and seven hours a day, depending on the population. S three to seven hours a day staring at screens. Not for work, we're not talking about work here. We're talking about... So if, if you're an average user now, you'll have spent about seven years of your life staring at a screen for non-productivity purposes. You know, we don't have a good correlation between values and motivation and behavior always. So, yes, I say that, but there I am sometimes, or there we all are, picking up our phone. Because in that moment of boredom, that moment where you have nothing to do, where you're waiting, God forbid, you wait for a minute. You know, you have 30 seconds of downtime or five minutes of downtime. Watch people when they have a minute of downtime they will instantly pick up their phone and start looking. We can't tolerate any moment of boredom anymore. Prayer and meditation require you to be centered and present, and uh, a screen always moves you from where you are to somewhere else. You're not present when you're on a screen because you're connected to some other place or some other person and you're out of that moment. It's probably the worst thing you can do in terms of centering yourself. Yeah. The place that people eat up a lot of time where they become compulsive or overusing their computers or their, their screens is not so much at work when they go to work and they you know, do their work on their computer, because I use my computer all day for work, but it's very work-centric. I don't spend a lot of time futzing around or looking at other stuff. It's our phones that really eat our time because that's a device that we have in our pocket or pocketbook that's available 24-7 and that's on and has access to the internet. So, you know, if that phone didn't have access to the internet, it would cease to have an interest to us. But it's, it's the dominant internet access portal now. So since it's with you all the time, it eats all the minutes between everything else you're doing and then keeps you up late at night or the first thing you check in the morning. So it's not so much that we can't use our computers for work. We all do. And, but that's not where I abuse any time on the internet. It's, it's all that other time that I waste or, uh, or that other people, you know, that we, you know, if you're into gaming, you're not doing that during your work day or your school day, although you sometimes you are. A lot of the patients we treat are school age. They're high school and college age. And they're gaming so much, they're not doing their schoolwork. The, the most popular issue we deal with is video game addiction. The second most is porn, 
followed probably by social media. And social media is fast catching up to, to porn in terms of the amount of time it eats. Um, you know, porn, the desire to see porn and to appreciate these images and be aroused by them is very hardwired, part of that same limbic circuitry that we were talking about. It's one of the two main circuit reasons why the nucleus accumbens and why we have that dopamine activation in the limbic system is food and sex, which is linked to our survival. So we're wired to appreciate sexual imagery or sexual behavior. It's really an issue of whether it becomes compulsive and how often we use it, and, and if it has any deleterious impact. Because what's the definition of an addiction? The definition of an addiction is a substance or behavior that's repeated in a compulsive form and that has a deleterious or negative impact in your life. I mean, there's lots of things we do that might be repetitive, but they don't really have a negative impact on our lives. So when somebody is using porn or using doing sex online enough that their life becomes unbalanced or that they have consequences, whether they be legal or academic or financial, and I've seen all of those, by the way, yeah. people losing their jobs, um, people getting arrested because they start, they get bored with what's on the regular porn and they start looking at child porn. Yeah. So until we see that, uh, there's not really an issue. Yeah. I mean, uh, one third of all web searches is for porn. One third of all web searches in the world is for adult, erotic, naked imagery. That's pretty shocking. That's trillions of hits. The thing that I want to teach and what I talked about in this lecture I did this morning is, first of all, I want to talk about the topic because sex in medicine isn't often even talked about. I mean, I teach at a medical school in Connecticut and um, I think I teach the only course on sexual medicine and sexual addiction and uh, internet addiction that they get in their eight years of training. Um, I want us to have a dialogue about it because sex is very shame-based in our culture. American culture is very puritanical and Victorian. Yet, we advertise with it, we sell with it, we put it everywhere. Certainly porn is extremely popular in the US. But internally, we have this schism between shame that, we, that it feels we're almost covertly bound, but overtly everybody's celebrating it. And that split is where I think sexual pathology and sexual compulsion and even sexual crime occurs is this tectonic um, eruption that occurs when you, when you facilitate the meeting of this covert and overt split between shame and internal states. Um, and we don't have a dialogue for it. 40% of American school systems don't have sex ed. So where do you think people are going to learn about sex? They're going to look at it online. Terrible place to learn about it, though. Very terrible place because it shows sex devoid of relationship and intimacy. I'd like to reach a larger audience. Like, I mean, I certainly treat patients. I'm studying, you know, we're putting together this residential center. I write. My next book, I'd like to have a broader audience. I'd like to impact the government in helping it set up regulatory and um, uh, accountability controls. I'd also love to help the industry. I'd love to work directly with the tech industry. They have, I've been, I've talked to them many times, but I've yet to sort of, I'd love to be hired as a consultant or work on some kind of think tank with them to help all of us create a solution. Because I think the solution is going to have to be parents and users and the tech industry and the government and doctors like myself to come up with sort of a way to manage all of this stuff. Because what it's doing is it's changing our society and people are more alienated and more discontent than they've ever been. And I am dead convinced that it's in large part due to the screen use, the excessive amount of time that people feel isolated and alienated on their screens. They're looking for connection, but they're looking for it in the wrong place. And I'm scared about what it's going to do to our culture, not just in the U.S.,
but throughout the world. Everywhere in the world has the same issue. I read stories from all over the world. So I'd love to be to create a solution that's broader and not just treat my patients and you know help a few people. I want to sort of work on a larger, in a larger palette and uh, paint a larger picture. That's and maybe that's because I've been doing this for a while and I I feel like it's time to sort of reach a larger audience. So that would be where I'd like to go. And I think that's where it's heading. I can. You know, I would love to, you know, have a company like Google have, you know, pick my brain about how they can, I mean, they've done that a little bit, but I'd love to, you know, have a relationship with them, you know, or Facebook and say, how do we make tech more human and more and less susceptible to compulsive use or addictive use? How do we educate people that how to use their technology in a more mindful or sustainable way? The first iteration of tech was keep our eyes on the screen. That's what they wanted us to do because they mine our data and they sell us things. That's why they wanted, you know, that's why social media exists. It doesn't exist because it wants us to connect with people. It exists because it mines our data and it sells us things. That, the social media is the gimmick they get used to get us to be on it. So we can look at people's photos and see where our high school, you know, classmates are. But the truth is, that's not why they want us to use it. And I think that's now becoming clear. It wasn't so clear before. So I want that to be sort of part of the dialogue. When you talk about looking at the screen and being isolated, it's kind of like sex without intimacy? It is like sex without intimacy. It's, it's, it's empty calories. It's what I call non-nutritional social interaction. It's, it, it's like, even when I use it, you know, because I want to talk about myself because I'm not innocent. I do all the same dumb things that I think other people do as well. And, you know, I'll scroll through it and I'm like, it's like eating a McDonald's hamburger. No offense to McDonald's, but it's like, you know, if I'm hungry and I want something nutritious, I might eat something nutritious. But the idea is, is that, you know, at the end of it, you don't really get anything from it. It doesn't give you anything. There's no real connection. It's not like calling an old friend and having a nice conversation or sitting down to coffee with somebody and connecting or talking to you guys. These are forms of social interaction that are nutritional. The crap that we do on these screens is, is literally um, nothing. You get nothing at the end of the day, but you pay with your life. You pay with the time with time, which is the only thing of value we have. That's the only thing that has any value, is time. So you're giving time and not getting anything. And I think that's, like, that's the message that has to be clarified, that the use of technology has to be based on our values, meaning how do you value your life and what things are important in your life and how do you fit your tech around that as opposed to fitting your life around your tech. You asked about AI, artificial intelligence. So that is growing. And we're, what we re don't realize is we're already having artificial intelligence. You know, I just bought a, a little thing from Amazon called a, a dot, which has a disembodied voice by the name of Alexa in it. And I can talk to it and then ask it questions. And I can even have it programmed to do things in my house if I want. That's a form of artificial intelligence. Part of the problem, though, with all these devices is that it robs our natural ability to practice neurological skills and exercise aspects of our brain that we need to do in order to keep them fresh. Now, some people would argue from an AI perspective that that's the natural evolution of humankind is to upload and offload aspects of our neurological function to devices outside of ourselves, whether they be a computer or an internet device or eventually a robot of some kind, and that that's a natural evolution. I'm not so sure about that. And uh, I mean, I think the jury is out on that. And the other issue is, of course, is the dystopian issue, which is the fear that ultimately, if we create intelligence that's as good as ours or close, we will lose control over it. And, you know, some people say, well, that's a dystopian science fiction film or book, and there's been dozens of them written. Um, 
But my feeling about literature is that if we can imagine it, it's possible. Because if you look back at some of the science fiction that was written 50, 60, 70, even longer, or even 20 or 30 years ago, before they wrote shows like Star Trek, all that stuff that they wrote about is here. We're do we have it and then some. Yeah. And that happened in a matter of two or three decades. So anything that we think or imagine, even as far-fetched as a robot that is autonomous and self-regulating, is absolutely possible. Because we can imagine it. And if we can imagine it, we'll find a way to build it. So I think that's a good use of technology. I mean, I, I think, the, you know, I'm not anti-tech. I'm not a Luddite. I'm not against the use of technology to improve life. I mean, the internet is an amazing thing, and it's done amazing things. But, you know, one of the taglines we use is that, uh, you know, the internet's a very powerful thing. And with, when we have powerful things, they can have powerful impacts. You know, so our goal is to help people plug back into life, which doesn't mean not use technology, but to use it in a mindful, sustainable way. To be, for us to control the technology instead of the technology controlling us. Okay. Mm -hmm.